my first question is, who can remember their first memory? I think we can all remember something of when we were younger, but it's trying to put it into order of how old we were when that incident happened. My first memory was that time at Christmas Eve, the doorbell ringing, getting woken up, looking over the banisters to see a policeman at the door, which was unusual in our household. <laughs> we didn't really have policemen coming to the door, not really understanding what was going on at the time either. Um, then going back to sleep, then a little while later, I remember my uncle being there, which was another kind of weird. But getting really excited because it was Christmas and I've got a twin sister. Me and my twin sister were opening the presents and looking really excited and running into mum's room. But obviously dad wasn't there. Um, and then slowly learning the incidences that had taken place that, you know, as a young kid, you're being told, you know, your dad's, unfortunately, there's been attacked by some nasty people. And as also as a young kid being a bit wary and frightened that there was these nasty people that were out there to, you know, do harm inevitably. The consequences is that obviously dad was, is still with us and he's still alive. Um, the attack left him uh, paralysed on one side of his face. Um, there was a lot of obviously trauma and things to get through. But I would say that my inspiration in life is not just martial arts, but is my family as a unit and it is my dad because the positivity that he spread afterwards led me to where I am now and doing martial arts. I think that his journey through life, um, he could have gone the complete opposite way and have a negativity towards anything in life. But instead, it was everything was always positive. And I guess it was positive because he had that alternative chance in life to then to do something else with it. And he tried um, various different jobs. And um, when I got to about 15 years old, uh, as any typical teenager would want to do, I wanted to go out a lot. And I wanted to go to under 18 raves, which were all, when I was a teenager, 15, they were all the, you know, everyone wanted to do it. And I remember him sitting me down and said, well, you know, if I'm to allow you to do this, I want you to learn some form of martial arts. I want you to be able to defend yourself. And I'd not really understood about martial arts. I was just, if I'm totally honest with you, it was two reasons why I was doing it. One, because it was good fitness and I was a bit vain at the time. Uh, and the second thing was, it would have been, if that meant I could go out, then <laughs> that's what I was going to do. So, you know, if I could go to these raves. And it was a group of us that started it to start with. We all ran down to the, the local sort of like leisure centre. Um, we started off at his Muay Thai, which is the, the art of eight limbs, which is punching, kicks, knees, elbows, throws. I didn't know much about the martial art. I thought it was similar to kickboxing, which a lot of people can say that it is similar to kickboxing. But I think the Muay Thai has a more spiritual element to it. Um, so we started doing it and I, I just found myself getting more and more engrossed in it. And the more I'd done it, the less I wanted to go out because I wanted to be down there all the time. Gradually, friends uh, dropped off. They... Um, they found other interests. Um, I was sort of 16, 17, really still getting into it. That's not to say I still wanted to go out, but every time I went out, I kept thinking about the session that I had on the Sunday morning. So I didn't want to go out too late because I wanted to be alert and I wanted to be awake and I wanted to be in the moment for the, the session sort of like the next day. So I really grew to sort of love the sport, but I think the defining moment for me is when there was a, a sensei that was there that, that turned around and actually gave me praise and said, oh, you're, you're, you're pretty good at this. You could actually, you know, do something. You could go better if you thought about competing. And for me, for someone to acknowledge that something I was doing was good and a positivity really spurred me on. So then it become like an addiction, people say, and I think we all in martial arts, if we've done martial arts, we know how addicting it is. But for me, it become almost like a drug. I had to get my next fix. I had to get my next training session in. And then when I started competing, winning wasn't the, it, it all. It, I had to go to the next stage and the next stage and the next stage. But all the way throughout the journey, what I, what I sort of found, it was the people around me and the positivity that was around me. Because at not at one stage, was anyone ever negative? There's always this reinforced message that I can do this, that you will win it, you will get this, and whatever you achieve in life that you will do. And I remember going and having a conversation with my, uh, my dad. And at the time he had a different job, it was at a factory. And uh, it was quite a boring job, he was sweeping up at the factory, but he was quite a proud man, he was providing for his family. And I remember telling him, but don't you get bored of working in the factory? And he didn't really know much about philosophy or martial arts or anything like that. I think he got to an orange belt in um, some form of karate. But he said uh, he high-chinged it. 
and I've never heard of the phrase I Ching before. Uh, and my dad's kind of like a very um, humorous person. He tells a lot of jokes. So I just thought it was a natural, here comes a joke that, at the end of it. Um, but his version of Hai Ching, he, he turned the sweeping in the factory into a task and a chore uh, is into something enjoyable. He'd time himself to see how quickly he could sweep up a certain area. And then there'd be a certain pattern if he could spread out the, 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 the black bits of the dirt to the white bits of the dirt or certain things he would do to make that task more enjoyable. And then that got me thinking that whatever challenges I sort of like face, although training's going to be hard at times, I'm going to feel like I don't want to wake up in the morning. I don't want to go. There's always going to be this element where I can turn any bit of the training into a positivity. Because if my dad can do it after what he went through, then surely I should be able to do it. After um, competing for a while, um, I finally got the opportunity to then compete for world titles. And I went to America, we went to Thailand, Switzerland, Belgium. And I just found myself competing in a, a range of uh, places with uh, meeting different people, cultures and just people I would never have met before or had the opportunity to meet. And it was uh, the diversity that I gained from it and the experiences because I found that when I went to Thailand, I was uh, close to Samui and we were living in different places, but we were living with local people and you learn so much from the culture and, and what you gained. And what I gained was that everyone is different and everyone has their own journeys that they're going through. And you just take so much from those journeys as well. Um, eventually, uh, around about 2005, I got the opportunity to then um, compete for the world title. And it was out in America. And I think I was uh, the underdog, to say the least. Um, I was given about two weeks notice because uh, I think someone else had pulled out. <laughs> so I got two weeks notice to, to fly out to, um, I think it was San Jose in the end. Uh, I got to the airport. Um, knew that someone's going to be picking me and my coach up uh, and there was a stretch limousine waiting for me at the airport and I was like what little did I know that they was cheaper than cabs that's why I had the stretch limo but at the time you know you felt this sense of oh wow this is great this is a journey um, I had a brilliant time out there but I lost I lost the world title first time I've ever had a chance to compete to it and I lost it so I remember coming back um, absolutely devastated and I think if anyone knows that the, the more you put an emphasis on something and something becomes your world and they become your ultimate um, fighting and combating sports can be lonely when you lose because you feel like you're the one that's lost and let everyone else down. And I think the only way that I could rebuild myself was the people around me again. And it was the coaches in particular that um, had this just, um, I, I, I can't express it enough, it's that their belief was enough for me. They had this unwavering belief that whatever happened, that, you know, this was just a testing block and the next time round, you know, we'd be able to do it. So then the next time was about a year later and it was in this country. So I was so happy that it was in front of family and friends. And I think I was happy that it was in front of my dad as well because he'd seen me sort of like take this journey and he was very proud. Um, my mum never liked coming to uh, watch me compete. Um, we once gave her a front row seat uh, to uh, uh, an event and uh, on the videotape of the fight, you can see an empty seat uh, where she's at the back, sort of like with her eyes like that. So um, she was never one to watch it, but my dad was sort of like very proud of it. After I sort of like won the world title, I, I, I got a job um, and it's working within the youth inclusion sector. So I was working with a, a bunch of young people um, from an estate is around Southwark area, which is uh, in inner city London area. And these young people um, didn't have much. Um, for me, the missing gap, they didn't have much hope. They didn't have much opportunities and they didn't have much guidance. Um, and I remember starting working with some of them. They're from youth offending teams. Some of them have been in prison. Some of them were on the verge of going into prison from all different walks of life. Everything they had in common, I would say, was they didn't have love. So they didn't have that someone home life. They, they, they seemed that they were lost. And as I started working with them, we, we used the martial arts and they all liked the boxing and the martial arts because it was credible and it was tough. And you could do the martial arts because that allowed you to be a man and it allowed you, it was strong and it allowed you to get away from the gang. And it was almost like an acceptance from the gang that you were doing this instead of that. So therefore, you know, he's, so we'll let, we'll let you go. So it was this, this sort of like a 
aura with them that yeah we we can do this uh, and it was a way of us c to connect with them to then grow them sort of like further and I remember that conversation of uh, going back home and my dad asked me how work was going and I was explaining to him what we were doing and we were working with these youth offending and I think uh, something that always stuck in my head was um, that the, the conversation and it went that if something like that had been in place when he when I mean I'm 40 years old now um, so this happened when I was five years old, so it's a, a good chunk of uh, years ago. But if something had been in place then, then ultimately, you know, maybe this wouldn't have happened. There would have been a constructive outlet for those young people. So that really sort of stuck in my head. And then the thought pattern sort of grew as in, well, why, why can't we do something about it? Why can't we do something about it on a bigger scale? Why can't we use martial arts? Uh, Muay Thai and the boxing to really capture these young people to give them positive role models and to make them give them more opportunities in life. So 2009 um, I set up the charity Fight for Change and the messaging about Fight for Change is you're fighting to change your circumstances. So everyone has a fight in life and everyone has a battle and we've all got our own battles but I think the important thing is, is how we cope with those battles and how we process those battles. And for me, uh, having the Muay Thai and the boxing and the martial arts, that helped me protest, um, process any conflicts I had with myself. It gave me an inner confidence. Um, it allowed me to talk openly to people. Um, it allowed me to approach people easier. Um, and not only that, while I was training, it, and, and I think others that have done martial arts here, it allowed me to focus in the moment. So when I was training, there was no other thing that was uh, interfering. There was no other thought pattern that was in my head. I wasn't worried about paying bills. I wasn't worried about a situation that maybe happened uh, before. I was just so in that moment and focused in that moment. And in a way, it was a form of meditation. And I think martial arts can be a form of meditation. It wasn't meditation as I knew it because I wasn't one of those people that sat down and meditated. I was always on the move and I was always sort of like going, but it allowed me to focus in that moment. And I think that's what those young people needed. They needed that, that gap, that space away from what they were doing. They needed to focus in that moment. But then that also led us to the point that it wasn't enough just the martial arts by itself. We needed to create opportunities for them and combine stuff because um, ultimately they needed opportunities, they needed work placements and they, they needed jobs. So it was an opportunity to get them all together. In 2014, I, was, um, I received a, a letter through the post. It was actually delivered to my mum's address. So when I went round there, um, there was an official and it had the Queen's emblem on it. I thought it was jury service. I thought I'd been called up for jury service. I think that's all I need. Not that there's anything wrong with jury service. <laughs> we will have to do our bit. Um, and I remember mum being really excited about open, open the letter, open the letter. And it was a letter from, um, it was David Cameron at the time that was the prime minister. Uh, and I'd been put up for a, an award, which was an MBE. Uh, but you had to keep it quiet and everything like that. So, I thought, okay. Um, and then in 2015, um, I received the award at Buckingham Palace. The only um, downside of that was uh, I remember my dad being so excited and so overwhelmed that I'd received this MBE. The consequences of my dad being attacked was there was... Um, uh, various different inner ear problems. Yeah, I think it's a Menez disease where you have these dizzy spells. It's a bit like vertigo. Um, he had various different complications from the surgery. Um, this was going back years, but obviously years later, it still affects you. So on the actual day where we're, we're, we're all set and we've got our dresses on, our hats on, and we're going to House of the Parliament, I've turned up my mum's uh, and my dad is just literally in bed. He's as white as a sheep. And there's no physically way he can get out of bed. So for me, that was a, a poignant moment where it was part of he really wanted to see that moment. But unfortunately, he couldn't. But yet his outlook on that was, you know, a positive spin. It wasn't a negative. It wasn't, oh, I've missed out. I've, you know, X, Y, Z. He was like, well, when you next go and you get to go and you see the Queen, you go to one of them garden parties or wherever it is, invite me along. So it was this apprehension that you'll go again. You'll get to go and I'll get to go with you and I'll get to go and meet X, Y, Z. So 
whatever someone challenges you in life, I feel that there's always a positivity around it. So I think it's always something that, you know, everyone can do. And I think without the martial arts side of it, without the competing and without that mindset, um, I don't think I'd be here. Well, I know I wouldn't be here talking, definitely talking to you guys. I don't think I'd have set up the charity. I think my life would have gone down a, a different route. Um, so that is my story in a nutshell. And it's all about how in that moment and that focus and positivity can really change your life for sort of like the better. Thank you.